Well, we are in Genesis 2. This is our second week of our series on the book of Genesis. And um, this is kind of an interesting one because, well, number one, my iPad won't open. All right, now we're good. Um, uh, really, it's a retelling of creation, and it's from a different perspective. A lot of people read Genesis 1 and then Genesis 2, and they go, oh, well, they're just contradictory, and so the rest of the Bible we should just kind of throw out. But instead, as you um, heard last week, Genesis 1 is not this chronological understanding of creation. Uh, instead, it is a polemic, a war of words against the ancient Near Eastern culture, and therefore today is not also uh, in chron chronological order. It is now telling the story of creation from a zoomed-in perspective on humanity. That's really the focus here, is on how, what are the priorities of God as he created man, and eventually woman. Um, and so I don't know about you, but last week when I start thinking about creation, I start thinking about lights and stars and moon and the, the mountaintops. I mean, I've already shared with you uh, my in, infatuation with Yosemite, so I don't have a picture of Yosemite anymore. I'm trying to spare you from those types of details. But when I start thinking about God's power, His sovereignty, His character on display, which is what we talked about last week, I start thinking crazy thoughts like, man, if I could just, I don't know where you go when you start thinking about God. God's power, when you start thinking about his sovereignty, his goodness, I don't know what, what pictures start to come into your mind, but perhaps it could be something like this, which is the Crab Nebula. I don't know if you know what the Crab Nebula is, but that's the Crab Nebula. Is it up there? Ooh, look at that. Um, so when you start thinking and you start Googling beautiful scenery or beautiful pictures of space, um, this is the types of thing that come up. So a Crab Nebula is a star's explosion. And, and for me, if I look at that, you get infatuated with space and you're one of those people that you see God's creation, his power, his goodness. When you start looking up at the stars, you might look at that and be like, man, that is amazing. Look at how much beauty there is in that. Or perhaps it's not the explosion of a star, but the birth of stars. This is what's known as Mystic Mountain. Look at that thing. Is that up? Nope. There it is. Mystic Mountain. That's a real picture from NASA. Uh, this is, again, these are newborn stars, but maybe space isn't your thing. Maybe that's not where you see God's power on display, God's beauty on display. Maybe it's not in space. Maybe it's in scenery. Like if my wife was in the room, she would just all, all of a sudden start getting excited about what I'm about to show. Um, so you start Googling beautiful scenery, and these are the pictures that come up. I've never heard of both, well, one of them I've never heard of, the first one. It's, um, it's in Italy, Lago di Sorapis. I don't know. I, sh I should be able to pronounce that because of my Italian heritage, but my lineage failed me somewhere along the line. But this is in Italy, right? That's in, look at that. I want to go to there. Does anybody else want to go to there? Yes. Look at that. That's beautiful. I want to go to there. All right, this next one is Phi Phi Le in Thailand. Um, if you ever saw the movie The Beach, which is just crazy. I saw it when I was lost, so don't judge me. I also enjoyed it when I was a believer, so maybe you should judge me. Anyways, there's this little cove of a beach where they kind of find their utopia in the movie The Beach. That's that beach. Unbelievable. So many tourists, by the way, have gone that they've had to shut it down. So you can't go, uh, and neither can I. Um, is this where you see God's power and his beauty, or do you see it in this picture? That is a picture of a woman in India, the picture I took maybe 10, 12 years ago. Um, she has put tattoos on her face to make herself less desirable to men because she lives in a culture where men do things. This person, the person you look at in the mirror, you are the culmination of God's creative work. Not the Crab Nebula, not the Mystic Mountain, not that beautiful beach or that place that I want to go to there. It is you. That God, it says in Ephesians 2.10, that we are His workmanship. We are His poema. His masterpiece. Humanity is his masterpiece. When you start thinking about creation, you're it. You're, there's, the, no mountain is as beautiful as when he looks at you. And I want you to think about that as we enter into, really, what should be three sermons, but we're going to do one. Because why not? We're going to think about what God's masterpiece is in you. And I want to ask you, do you believe that about yourself? When you look in the mirror, do you think, man, this is God's masterpiece, or you just start looking at everything that's wrong? Yeah, me too. Namely with, with what's going on up here. Let's just start there and go, that's it, I give up. All right, I'm done. 
God's creation, though, of man was different than everything else. If you remember back to last week, Genesis 1, how did he create everything? Every, every animal, every animal in the sea, in the air, on the land, every animal for all time, all creation, the stars in the sky, the planets, the galaxies, also every, every mountain, every valley, how did he create it? If we look at the scriptures, he flung it into existence with his word. And he spoke it into being. But when it comes to you, when it comes to Adam in particular, and then Eve in a few moments, he does something far greater and far different. You see, there's something different happening in Genesis 2 than in Genesis 1. In Genesis 1, the word for God is Elohim. This powerful, beautiful name that, that the scriptures are using to describe a powerful, creative God in the act of creation. But in Genesis 2, it changes. And you may not see it. Because in the English, it's real hard to see. But it says, the Lord or God in, in, uh, in Genesis 1. But in Genesis 2, 11 times does the phrase, the Lord God. And that is a different name. If you want to know what Lord is with the little small caps... That's Yahweh. And Yahweh, if we know anything about the names of God, Yahweh is the covenant-keeping God of the Bible. In other words, what's on display here is not God's power and God's might, although it is on display. What is emphasized in Genesis 2 is God's personal connection with what's going on. That the Lord God now creates man. And He doesn't do it with His Word. No, He stoops down into the earth and gathers dirt and does something significant and unique with humanity with his own hands. He's now not speaking bara. He's not just now creating something that is very unique to God. Now he is forming, the Bible says. In Genesis chapter 2, verse, oh, where is it? 7. Then the Lord God formed the man of dust from the ground, and then he did something more intimate than just form it with his hands like a, 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 a master to the clay, right? A potter to the clay. He does even something more intimate than that. He gets real close. And after he bores holes in our head with nostrils, whew, he blows and breathes life into us. Now, I want you to think about how close Jesus how close God is in that forming act. He's intimate. He's right there with you. There's something different going on in Genesis 2 that involves you, my friend. He's not doing it with His Word and just flinging everything exactly how He wants it to be. There is a perfection going on here with humanity. Psalm 139 says that you are wonderfully made, intricately designed in the womb on purpose. So if there was one big picture kind of takeaway from Genesis 1 is that nothing happens by accident and so it is in your creation. And not only is it not by accident, it is intimate. It is personal. He's all up in your business in the best possible way. That's what God is doing here in Genesis 2. He is doing something special. Nothing accidental and, I, and as I look at that, I start thinking about, man, as he's just now intimately and specifically created Adam, it says in the first part of Genesis 2, what are his priorities? What kind of world has he set up for Adam to thrive in? What are his gifts to Adam? How is it? What are his top priorities that he wants him to be about for him to understand really what God is about? And that's why I want to entitle today's sermon, Three Gifts for Men. Now we're going to get to women. But I'm talking about men because we're talking about Adam. We're going to get to Eve, okay? And there's a, there's a beautiful story when we get to Eve, okay? But right now, three gifts for men, and I'm going to give them to you right here. You ready? Work. It's a beautiful gift. We're going to talk about it. Worship. We're going to define that. And a woman. That's a beautiful, amen, amen. Nick Van knows. Nick Van knows. He knows. He, he's reading Genesis 1, Genesis 2 going, oh, yeah, blah, blah. Like blood of my blood, flesh of my flesh, here we go, bone of my bone, right? He's, he's in it, just like we all should be. By the way, you just got a lot of points. So did Chris Madigan, by the way, with that prayer. Lord, we just love the women, just love the women, love the women, love the women. Yes, yes. A gift. 
Gift number one, work. Read with me, Genesis 2.15. The Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it and to keep it. We're going to talk a lot more about work next week, which is what's known as the cultural mandate. But what you need to understand, men and women, is that, the, it, that work is a gift. It is not the result of the fall. A lot of us go, and we kind of treat it, treat work through the American mindset, which is work is bad. It's only an end or a means to an end. At some point, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to quit doing that bad thing, and I'm going to go do whatever I want, also known as retirement from work. And some of us, I'm not saying, well, let's just say this. Some of us have set up our entire lives to save enough so that you can get a good nest egg for retirement. I don't know about you, but I'm in my mid-40s now, and I start thinking about, okay, how do I need to set up my life a little bit differently? Things I didn't think about a decade ago in regards to retirement. It's not a bad thing, but it, it can be a bad thing when we think retirement is just ceasing of all work and doing away with all things that are according to God's design, a gift for us. If you look at the scriptures, there are two things that he tells uh, people to do, man to do. And that is to work the garden and to keep it. Man, I want you to think about this in regards to your vocation, but also in regards to your family, in regards to your marriage, in regards to your spiritual life, that there are two things that he's putting before us to work something, to cultivate it. It, literally, it's to till the ground. It's hard work. Even in the most perfect setting, the Garden of Eden, it's still hard work. And there's something to be said about hard work. I don't know how you feel at the end of a long day, but I feel tired and refreshed. Do you know that feeling? And at the end of a boring day where I'm just sitting around, I'm grumpy. Why? Because there's something in us. There's God's good design in us that we were created for work, even before the fall. Again, work is not a curse. Instead, creation needed your skill set. I want you to hear this. Creation needed our skill set for it to produce. He wanted us to get into the land, to, to, to till it, to work it, to cultivate it, to produce. And then the second thing he tells us to do, not just to work it, to cultivate it, but also to keep it, to care for it. The word there is to guard its well-being. In other words, working it is one thing. Working for production is one thing. But tending to what it produces, caring for what it produces, guarding the garden is quite another. I hear a lot um, of especially younger men who may live in neighborhoods around these parts. Maybe they start with MM. And I hear of a lot of, uh, particularly in that neighborhood for whatever reason, uh, but many others where they, their, their main goal for whatever in life is to go produce for my family and go have fun on the weekends. And I don't think that's a bad goal, but it, it only has one priority of the garden in mind, and that is we're also there to protect what's been produced. We're also there to guard what it is that God has given us. Not just to produce, not just to go and make a paycheck and pay for whatever it is for our family that they need, but also to be present, to guard, to care. So I would say this, deep in your bones, men, you know this. You have a feel for this type of work deep in your bones to protect and to provide. And so, men, I would ask you, how are you exercising your God-given design to produce and to protect, to cultivate, and to care for all that God has given you? Again, not just your paycheck or where you find your paycheck in your work, but also in your family, in your marriage, if you're married, and in your relationship with the Lord. This is gift number one. Gift number two is worship. Gift number two is worship. We got work. It's a beautiful gift. We're going to talk more about that, so I'm going to be a little bit short. But also, we got a lot to say about worship. Look at what Genesis 2, 16 and 17 said. So now the Lord God takes, remember it's that Lord God, the Yahweh, puts the man in the garden to work it and to keep it, provide and protect, care and cultivate. And then he also says this in verse 16, And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, You may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. 
For in the day that you eat of it, you will surely die. How do you define worship? You think about it in your mind. What is the first thing that comes into your mind when you think about worship? I think most of the times we, in our Christian subculture, we define worship as what we did for the first 20 minutes today. We sing. But worship has more to do with your entire life than it has to do with singing. Is, it, is singing included? Absolutely. When we start talking about we want to follow Jesus in all of life, that's another phrase to just say, I want you to worship Jesus. We need to find him worthy above all things and above all people to center your life around. If you want to think about what worship is, it's truly centering your life around whatever is most important. Centering your life around whatever is most important. In the garden, God helps us see that worshiping God is rooted in trusting him. Trusting God at his word. The Bible, God says to Adam, do not eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And what we will find is that one chapter later in Genesis 3, they will quickly be tempted. Will I trust God at his word or do I need to take what God has put a boundary around into my own hands? Am I going to experience this or am I going to trust him? You guys remember Johnny Manziel? Good old Johnny Football? He was also born on December 6th, just like me. I don't know if you knew that. But anyways, Johnny Football, if you remember when he was coming out of um, the motherland, uh, Texas A&M, don't do it. There you are. Um, If you remember when he was getting drafted, um, one of the things that he had scouting reports, right? He's my height, so it's probably not ideal when you're talking about being a quarterback. But one of the things that they told him or what they scouted about Johnny Manziel was this. And this is the one thing that stuck with me. I don't read scouting reports. Okay, I'm not that much of a nerd. But I did like Johnny Manziel because he was born on my birthday. Um, And it is my birthday. He shares it with me. And, um, And because I enjoyed this particular scouting report. And that was this. Johnny Football... His biggest limitation isn't his height. It's not his skill set. His biggest limitation is this, that when you tell him, don't make that throw, you're going to get intercepted. He's not going to listen. He's going to do it anyways. That is a great understanding of what Adam and Eve will eventually be tempted into. Are you going to trust someone else's word or you have to experience the consequences of what they say will happen? That is a good definition of worship. And in God's definition of worship, he puts two guardrails for worship up. He gives us permission and he gives us prohibition. He says, you shall surely eat. You you are free to eat. The NIV says, you are free. The first thing that God says to humanity, you are free to eat of any tree in the garden. Permission. Look at how much beauty there is in God's character and what he gives to humanity. And yet there's also prohibition because he knows their freedom doesn't just come without tethering it to something. It never has come without tethering it to something, without some restriction. We want to know what freedom is. If you look at the New Testament, freedom is found by being enslaved to Jesus. Being tethered to Jesus. That's what freedom is. Not doing everything we want to do, but being truly tethered to him, our arms around him, as if he's everything we've got. That's where we find true freedom. We see the same thing right here in the garden. In this perfect place, this perfect environment, where there's a a perfect relationship with God and man, he gives permission and prohibition. You may surely eat, but don't eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For if you do, and when you do, you will surely die. When I think about that and I think about freedom, I want us to understand boundaries are a gift from the Lord. This idea that we can do whatever, whenever, however, is not from the Lord. Like There is still prohibition. There is still boundaries and limits. Even within the perfect environment of the Garden of Eden, with perfect union with God. You see, the great lie which comes in Genesis 3 tells us that God is holding out on us. That He's only limiting us because He knows that there's a better life and He's holding out on you. And that is the great lie. Instead, these prohibitions are a gift. These boundaries are God's way of loving us. 
So you might be asking, what is the tree of the knowledge of good and evil? After all, it would, be, it would apparently be pretty important. That is the thing that Eve takes a, off the fruit, off the vine, and eats, and then shares it with her husband, which we'll talk about in Genesis 3. There's a lot of controversy and a lot of conversations around what this is, this idea of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. But to cut to the chase... I'll give you what I truly believe contextually it is. And that is this. Moral autonomy. Moral autonomy. And you might go, okay, those are two words that I understand, but when you put them together like that, I don't think I understand. Moral autonomy. It's defining right and wrong based on you. What world are you in? What feed do you see? What government do you serve under and live under? What world's economy are we in? But is it not defining good and evil on our own? Is that not what every injustice is about in the world and therefore every justice, every war, justice warrior is trying to, to kind of bring it back under a good understanding of right and wrong? But it would be easy to talk about society and politics and those things out there. Let's talk about us in here. You see, Jesus um, was surrounded by some guys that like to define right and wrong based on their own understanding of what God should do as Messiah. If you remember, um, Jesus asks the disciples in Mark 8, who do you say that I am? And uh, Peter like, responds with a beautiful revelation that you are the Messiah. You're the one with the words of life. And Jesus says, man, blessed are you, Simon. This has been revealed to you by my Father, basically. And then the next little bit, right there in the same chapter, Jesus starts to explain to them, the Son of Man will surely suffer and die. And Peter can't handle it. You remember what Peter did? He stands up and he's like, never. I will never let that happen. Not on my watch. No way. And Jesus looks at Peter and says this in Mark chapter 8, verse 33. Turning, seeing his disciples. He didn't just see Peter. He had everybody else's spiritual lives in mind when he got up and rebuked one of his best friends. He rebuked Peter and said to him, you, Peter, you got to get behind me, Satan. For you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. You see, even one of Peter's, one of Jesus' best buddies got it wrong when he started to think about defining good and evil, life and death. Surely it's to preserve this Messiah's life. And Peter and, and Jesus clearly says, no, no, you are not understanding really what was lost in the Garden of Eden. And if you want to know what worship is about, if you want to know what following God is about, Jesus defines it right there in that one verse. Will you live with the things of men in mind? Or will you live with the things of God in mind? And for the rest of your life, you'll have this, 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 this seesaw kind of going back and forth. How am I going to live? With the things of man in mind? Self-preservation? Or the things of God in mind? Where I lay myself down for the sake of loving the Lord and loving others as Jesus did. When we determine what we think is good or evil, life or death, based on what suits us, we are pursuing a life outside of God's good and perfect design, and we will die. As Adam and Eve's children, the question is not how have we uh, had bad definitions of life and death, good and evil, but really, like, not just if, but how have we done this? So defining good and evil, life and death, according to God's definition, seems to be important here. So I want to bring you into an exercise that was given to me that was life-changing. Dr. Larry Crabb, when I went to his school for spiritual direction, like in 2011 in Colorado, went for a week, changed my life. Okay, Derek, uh, Larry Crabb died last year um, due to cancer, but nonetheless, his legacy lives on through people like me and many others because he, would, he put us through exercises like this when we talked about the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And it was a beautiful exercise, and I'm going to put it before you, not for you to do right now, but maybe you need to do it later with your spouse or a really good trusted friend. Here's the exercise. Go into your memory bank when you were a kid. And think about the memory that gives you the most life. 
that, that makes you feel most alive, right, as a child. I can remember mine. I mean, when, as soon as he gave us his exercise, I could think of it right away. I remember playing baseball. Baseball was a big deal to me, probably too big of a deal. It's why God gave it, uh, took it away. It would have been an idol for me for my whole life. I wasn't that good, thank God. But there was a day where I made this play, and my mom is going to start smiling right now. I, I remember, it, like, like I can still remember, I was a catcher, and it was a pop foul, and I shouldn't have caught this ball, but I caught this ball, and I got up, and everybody cheered, and I was muddy, and all my friends didn't care, and it was like, woo, celebration, yeah. I can remember that as one of my greatest memories as a kid, making me feel alive. And Dr. Larry Crabb would say, now, what you need to do is sit with someone that will help you realize how you've defined life based on that really good memory. And how I've defined life is by doing really hard things. It's not a bad thing. It's just a bad definition of worship. Okay? I can do really hard things. I, can, I, can do th I love to do things that are stacked against me. If you say you can't on the golf course, you can't drive that. Oh, we're going to see if we can do it today. Here we go. I'm going to throw my back out, but we're going to make it happen. Why do I get injured every other week? Because I'm trying to do things that my body can't handle usually. <laughs> I have defined that and made it ultimate. And so I have to find ways where I have to repent of where I have defined a life based on me. Because you know what that does? It condemns other people that don't do hard things. See, you see how it gets out of whack? And you could do this... The same thing with how you define evil. You go into your memory bank, and this is not nearly as fun, but you go into your memory bank when you were a kid, and you go, where is it that I felt most threatened, dead? And I can start to realize this is exactly how I have defined evil. It's where I've defined death. And therefore, it's not the thing I'm pursuing, but the thing I'm avoiding. So if you grew up in a household with a lot of conflict, you're probably defining death as conflict, and you may avoid it like the plague. But you and I both know there's a lot of growth that can come with living in some conflict. So you start to see how we have become morally autonomous based on our own memories. And, and, and here's the deal. God is inviting us to center our lives, rearrange our lives, how he has defined death and life. And how he's defined it is trusting in him. Taking God at his worth. Having deep faith and the kind of God that flung the stars out with his word and formed you and I with his hands and with his breath. So when he says you're going to die if you do this, we don't, we're not Johnny Manziel. Oh, I can make that throw. It's not going to kill me. I'm the exception. We're not. We as humans have to understand that we are creatures of our creator and he created us for a purpose. And that purpose is to find life abundantly in his son Jesus, whom he sent to die for us, purchasing us and bringing us into his family. We want to know where we find life is in him, the creator of that tree, the protector of our souls. But maybe the psychological approach is not your jam. That's fine. Let me give you a different approach in regards to worship. Growing in worship in particular. There's a guy by the name of Bernard of Clairvaux. He was a 12th century monk. Um, if you don't know this about me, I grew up Catholic, and I like to dabble in the Catholic mystics. I like to read those guys. I think they have a lot to teach us about how to form ourselves into Christ. And this guy named Bernard of Clairvaux wrote about four phases of worship, four phases of love. This is for you. I want to give this to you. You can, you can talk about this with your spouse, with your neighborhood group, but there are four phases of love. Maybe the psychological approach is not for you. That's fine. Larry Crabb is not your jam. Let me present to you my boy Bernie of Clairvaux. This is what he says. There are four phases of love or worship that when you come into this world, phase one is this. I love me for my sake. This is every infant that you've ever been around, every child you've ever been around. Like they're just looking out for number one. I need, I need, I need, I need. And if you have a newborn in here, you're already getting stressed out with me saying, I need. Right? That's where we are. You love yourself for yourself. You're looking out for number one. Phase number two, if you become a believer, this may be your best, your, your first understanding of who God is and worship. I love God for my sake, for myself. This is fire insurance. This is, oh, well, why do you love God? Because of all the things that he's done for me. 
Why are you going to heaven? Because I can say these words and I can get out of jail free. I love God because of what he does for me. Not a bad thing, but you're only on phase two. Phase three, I love God for God's sake. It is truly loving him for who he is, not for what he does for you. Oh, let me invite you to phase three. There's so much more beauty in phase three than there ever was in phase two. If your relationship with God, with Jesus, is based on what he's just done for you, we're missing, we are missing out so much on the beauty of who God is. Let us love him for his sake, not because of what he gives to us, but simply for who he is. And then phase four, which many say is impossible to get to in this world, that you love me. I love myself for God's sake. It's this idea of what Brennan Manning talked about when he says that do you really believe that God loves you for who you are and not who you should be? Because no one is as he should be. Do you believe that God loves you for who you really are or do you think he loves you because he expects you to be something that you're not? There's a love for self that now you love yourself for the sake of God. And there's some beauty in that as well. Do you see how if we center our lives around God's good definition of death and life, good and evil, we can follow him and journey through these phases of not just loving me for me, not just loving God because of what he does for me, but also loving him for who he is. And then finally realizing, you know what, God's poema, his masterpiece, his, it, it, there's no accidents in my life. And I can start to accept the fact that he loves me just the way I am. And therefore I can too. If the God of the universe can love me that way, surely I can love myself in that way. So perhaps it would be a good exercise for you to discern what phase of worship you're in. Why do you love God? Is it for you? Have you made the journey of loving yourself, truly loving and seeing how God loves you for who you are? Again, that may be a great exercise for you, or perhaps it would be good for you to sit down with your spouse or a trusted friend and discover how you have defined life and death and discern whether or not it is in keeping with the way God has defined good and evil. That's a beautiful picture of worship. We've already talked about work, and now finally, the final gift for man is a woman. Let's read verses 18 through 25. Then the Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. All right, I got to stop. We're going to get to woman. We're going to get there. But let me just say this. You're in a perfect environment, Eden. You're in a perfect relationship, man and God. It should absolutely shock us that God just said something is not good. We're in the best environment there's ever been. And God's saying, no bueno for you to be alone. So before we get to a woman, I almost... I almost broke from, from the W's here and just said community. Because it's more than just a marriage relationship. It's also what it looks like to be a part of the fellowship that we talked about with the devotions that we have as a church. That, we're, that the early church was devoted to the fellowship. This committed partnership of loving one another, being shaped by one another into the image of Jesus. It is not good for you to be alone. If you are in the camp that community is optional, that you come in and you leave on a Sunday morning, and that's your definition of community, and no one has a fishing license into your life to figure out what needs to get caught out of your soul so that you can grow into Jesus, like if you don't have that, this is your sermon. This is your sign. Community is not optional. You were created in the image of a communal God. Father, Son, and Spirit. You were created in that image. In a community. Your inherent design is communal. We are already in a world that celebrates autonomy and independence. And now a pandemic come al comes along. And now the narrative that you're hearing, reading, thinking, and seeing is that you got to isolate. you got to socially distance. you got to quarantine. 
These are all good things. I'm not dogging on them, okay? All the nurses in the house, all the doctors in the house, chill. <laughs> all good. We've done our fair share of quarantining in our house and isolating and socially distancing and doing the things that are necessary to care and love for not just ourselves but also our neighbors. All good things. But if we take good things and we get them out of order, all of a sudden we're going to start using a pandemic and isolation and quarantining and socially distancing ourselves to just do the bare minimum, which is consume a sermon online and call it good. Not good, God would say. It is not good for man to be alone. We must be an invested people into one another's souls. You can, you can survive on your own, but you will never live according to God's design and you will never thrive the way God intends for you to thrive. You're missing out on so much. If we just get, and I'm not talking about the introvert, all right? Introverts are cool. I'm introverts, that's why I'm not talking about them. But like, no, but for real, like if you are using any sort of good thing to make it ultimate and therefore pull away from community and using that as the thing, I mean, let me invite you. Is community frustrating? Yes. Are they going to disappoint you? Dang right. Are you going to disappoint them? You better believe it. All a great picture that your ultimate hope is found in Jesus, not in people. Also, not in just being alone. It is not good. Do not avoid community. Do not avoid the fellowship. But now to the woman in verse 18. Then the woman, uh, then the Lord God said, It is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helper fit for him. Now out of the ground the Lord God had formed every beast of the field and every bird of the heavens and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called every living creature, that was its name. The man gave names to all livestock, to the birds of the heavens, to every beast of the field. But for Adam there was not found a helper fit for him. Most people think that God paraded all of God's creatures across Adam so that he could also understand and feel that he was alone. That a relationship, a perfect relationship, even between man and God, was not enough. There had to have been something better than just this relationship here. Or at least insufficient is this, and you also need this. It continues... So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man, and while he slept, took one of his ribs and closed up its place with flesh, and the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. Somebody better get excited. Then the man said, this, oh baby, this at last is bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh, and she shall be called woman, Ish, Isha. Because she was taken out of man, Ish. She's taken out of me. This one looks like me. This one is the helper fit for me. This is exactly what I was hoping for in this woman. And then it says, Therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. There's so much I could preach on right now, but I'm just going to talk about a couple things. And we'll be done. I've preached on this before a few years back on biblical womanhood. So if you want to go back into our archives on our website, you can get a fuller picture of what we understood and what we do understand through the scriptures as what it means to be a woman. But let me just hit some highlights. He fashioned, designed intentionally the female to fit the male as a helper. Now, for those of us in this world... We hear helper as some sort of subservient role to a man. That's not true. Instead, God is described as a helper a lot through the Old Testament. I'll give you one passage. It's Psalm 54. Behold, God is my helper. Same word. The Lord is the upholder of my life. This idea of to be a helper for a female to a male is to build strength into others. That means that males don't have all the strength by themselves. That females bring a level of strength and security and stability to males that we would never have otherwise. Praise God and amen. Thank you. 
And this helper is fit. It is perfectly designed to complement that male in their mission. Which again, we're going to talk about that more next week. There's a fit there. It's a perfect fit. Um, I don't know about you, but during the pandemic, I started to do crazy things like price out a pool. And when I priced out a pool from my backyard, I quickly ran out of resources and did not get a pool. But it was a cool little experience to get with the designer of a pool and to start thinking about all the things that my family would enjoy in this fantasy world that I'll never experience. <laughs> it was so much fun, and I just thought, oh, man, if I could ever have this, this is what I would do. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to custom fit this thing for my family. And then that bill came, or that quote came, and I went, hey, all right. Woo, that was fun, wasn't it? Let's just pair this thing back to like what I would say is like bare bones. Oh, it's still that much money? I'm going to pass. I don't want that pool. And I just thought about that when it starts thinking about this, this, this female that's fit for the male. God never ran out of resources to make it exactly what every male might need. It was perfect. It was a perfect fit for him. A perfect fit. And he never ran out of resources to be able to fit that for him. It was beautiful and good. It was out of his rib. That's why it's not subservient. The great commentator, Matthew Henry, says this about the woman. The woman is not made out of his head to top him, not out of his feet to be trampled upon by him, but out of his side to be equal to him, and under his arm to be protected, and near his heart to be beloved. What a great and perfect relationship that God has put into the heart of man to produce and to protect. And He gave a woman to help him with those things. There's two goals of every marriage. Number one is unity, oneness, one flesh. right? And the other one is to be naked and not ashamed. And that's not exactly what you think it is. It is this emotional vulnerability where you know that you could be wounded by the other person, but you trust them so well that they won't wound you with whatever they know. You know that place. I hope and pray you know that place in marriage. It's a beautiful place to venture into, where you could be wounded. You, You know you're naked at that point, but there's no shame. There's no judgment by that other person. And so therefore, freedom comes about. Now, let me just say this. If you're single, you might be thinking, okay, this has nothing to do with me. Well, if everything that was said about being married or single was found in Genesis chapter 1 and 2, I suppose you could say that. But Jesus was single. He didn't marry Mary Magdalene, no matter what conspiracy theory you are into. Okay, he didn't have children, no. No, he he was single, right? So there must be something there. And then Paul then describes the the gift of singleness, and he calls it a gift. And he says, if you're single, you have a gift. Why is it a gift? Because married people, people with physical children, are absolutely distracted to the mission of making, maturing, and multiplying disciples. If you're single, you're not distracted like I am. you, You can use your Saturday however you want. I don't. I chase children, multiple just as you probably do. It's a distraction. It could be seen as a major distraction unless you see those environments as your place to make mature and multiply disciples. But if you're single, this is not to say that you don't have an integral role in the kingdom. You have a lack of distraction. You can go truly and enter into places that I could never go as someone who is married and has children. And what a gift that is. We'll talk more about that again next week. So I'll end with this. I know I've been up here long enough. Man, how are you providing and protecting an environment where your wife can be vulnerable with you? Women, how are you helping him create an environment where you can be vulnerable? Are you helping your husband the way that God helps you? Single people in the house. How are you cultivating the kind of community where you can be seen and known outside of a marriage relationship? And everyone, are you treating isolation as something that is not good or something that is simply good enough? Let's pray. Lord, let these questions ring in our hearts as something that we need to consider. 
I pray for our students as they've learned and, and listened through Genesis 2 today outside of this room in a level that they can interact and comprehend. I pray that you would help them understand the true beauty of community, the true value of marriage, the true beauty of limits and boundaries. I pray that you do the same for our hearts. I pray you help us see that one of the great fruit of the Spirit is self-control, that we would not define life on our own terms but we'd fold our understanding of life into yours. Holy Spirit, help those who need to go into the exercises that we talked about today, either through Dr. Larry Crabb or through Bernard of Clairvaux. Or maybe it's just to sit with you, Holy Spirit, to help us be guided through a better understanding of life and death, good and evil. Help those that are struggling with work amongst the great quit that we are in. Lord, help us see it as a gift. Yes, it's hard, but that's a result of the fall. Instead, it is a part of our design that we would work, that we would nurture, that we would guide and guard. Whatever it is that we need to walk away with from today, Lord, help us see it so that we may live and worship you as a result. It's in Christ's name do I pray. Amen. Let's worship together.